seated. All right. Thank you, worship team. Well, if you don't know that I'm a Star Trek fan by now, you probably never will. Alan, you got a video ready there for us? All right. We're going to focus on missions today. Just start us out, get us thinking. So we are not just to send people, but to go ourselves. And that's a hard truth for us because the most comfortable place to be as a believer is right here because it's safe. We're surrounded by other people who are believers and it's comfortable. And which of us go looking for that which is not comfortable? Something has to happen with us, within us. Something on the spiritual level has to happen for us to seek out something that is challenging for us to do. And yet, that is what God has called us to do. So in Star Trek, of course, the mission is to boldly go where no man has gone before. Okay, all right, or no person has gone before. So then, they are not the only ones. All right, we are to boldly go and reach unreached people groups. And so certainly the beginning point is when we begin to give. I mean, every time you, you can't actually give to this church without money going to missions. We have a, a percentage of money that, that is given in our tithes that goes to international uh, mission board missions, North American mission board missions, and a bunch of other missions organizations. And then we also send people out from this church ourselves on mission and we help fund them and so but that for many is the ending point you know maybe you you work yourself up to the place where you're you're giving in that that capacity then you think well that's the end I've I've completed that process and really that is the beginning point that's the first place that we begin is we we send other people out because in essence that's what you're doing when we give financially we're supporting missionaries to go out before there was a Life's Journey Church, there were two missionaries, my wife and I, and that was it. That was how it started. And then came Jeff and Annette, and then came others, and now there's a church where there wasn't one before, and that's how missions happens, is when one or two hear God's call and they move forward boldly to uh, fulfill that. Acts 1.8 says, and if you have it memorized, Okay, or if you know it, or you can even cheat and read your Bible, say it with me. But you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That is the verse that captures it for us. Because we're commanded to, to be on mission everywhere. Everywhere we go. Here, a little bit farther, a little bit farther than that, and then very, 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 very far away. Remember the, the first time that I went to Ukraine, uh, which is a former Soviet Republic, it's literally on the other side of the world. We're here, Ukraine, if this was a globe, we're here, Ukraine is over here. This is completely on the other side of the world. It take, took me about 25 hours to get there. And I really felt like I had entered the twilight zone. Now most of that was probably jet lag. <laughs> lack of sleep and, and, and in my moods, they don't go together well. And so I'm sure that was a big part of it. But when you leave the culture that you are comfortable in, then it is normal for us to experience culture shock. Because believe it or not, the rest of the world does not live like us at all. I mean, it is completely different. And the things that we would think of as core cultural values are not shared by any means. Many of those are not even shared here in the United States. And believe it or not, and this may come as a really big surprise, some of those values are better than ours. In fact, my experience is that every time I leave the United States of America, the people that I meet are less selfish more humble, more caring, more giving. So what does that say about our culture? Well, it says that, that we, in, to some extent, are an unreached people group. Christians have become, uh, where we were a cultural majority, we have become, I don't even know, I mean, a subculture at best. And so we are fighting a cold war, perhaps might be a way to think about it, against a culture of darkness, a culture of hatred and selfishness that is overwhelming us and is destroying our families, it is destroying our marriages. The dishonesty and theft in the workplace and in other places is so overwhelming that businesses are going out of business because there's, there's so much stealing that they can't make a profit and so they, they go under. And, and some of these things are, we've become very desensitized to them because we're used to seeing that on the news, we're, news, we're used to seeing that happen and so we don't realize what a tragedy it is. So I think the question then uh, we must ask ourselves is what is a missionary then? What does it mean to be a missionary? What does it mean to be on mission? Because we, we talk about that a lot. You know, I hear that a lot about being on mission and such, but what does that mean? Well, a missionary is very simply this, and we're going to watch a video in just a minute that kind of helps us understand that. But, but a missionary is someone that leaves or stays, either way, uh, someplace, and they have a goal or a mission to reach the lost with the truth of the gospel. And so they look at the culture in which they're trying to reach, they discover and understand that culture and they learn to speak the language if that's necessary uh, and, and other things like that and then they share truth with them. That's what a missionary really is. So, so we can be missionaries to our own culture. I mean that's really what church planning is. Church planning is, is missions to our own culture. Or there's international missions and then everything in between. But it's really the same thing. So we don't that's hard for us, especially me. I grew up in a traditional church, and so when you talked about a missionary, you were talking about somebody that went somewhere else. And that was all that you were talking about. And you didn't and we didn't understand that we were to be missionaries to our own culture, to our own people group. You know what's really interesting to me, it kind of proves this point. That whenever we send missionaries out, you know, in the, the old school way, which wasn't as effective, what we would, we, they would go and, and these missionaries, they would, they would live there forever and they would try to, to lead the people and the different cultures and, and run the church. The problem is that their cult, our culture is so different from theirs that, that it would take them decades, if, if they could even do that in a matter of decades, to learn that culture and to fit in and adapt to that culture that the opportunities that they had to reach people were significantly diminished. But you know what our strategy is now? Is that we send people to make disciples in those areas 
And then those missionaries move on to another place. And why is that? Well, think about it. The best person to reach your friends is you. See, it's not somebody that they don't know that doesn't speak their language. It's you. And so I think that as believers, if we claim to be Christian, then we are beyond obligated. We ought to be excited and passionate about leaving the comfortable place of our life. And what does that mean exactly? Well, that can mean leaving the United States and going somewhere else. And it certainly does mean that because Acts 1-8 doesn't say, well, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and if you can afford it or if you have time to or if you just you know, think it might be nice, go to the ends of the earth. No, those, those are all included there. So we are commanded personally, okay, he didn't say send other people to do that. He said, go and be my witnesses. Now that's a, hard, that's a big challenge. It was a big challenge for me, uh, even someone that began uh, going on short-term mission trips when they were in uh, junior high or in high school. It was a challenge for me uh, because, you know, I had to work, I had things to do, it cost a lot of money usually. Um, you know, there was all these reasons and obstacles between me and the mission field. And so I had to overcome one obstacle at a time in order to get there. And so I want, I want you, as we're talking about this today, to begin to think about that in your life. What are the obstacles that you have to overcome? If you were to go, we're going this year in October to Ukraine. And that is our passion. Unless Satan just completely wrecks the trip, our goal is to go there and for about nine days and uh, continue the church planning work that, that several of us began years ago uh, when there were only seven churches. Now there's 20 some odd there and that, that work continues uh, to move rapidly and we want to go and be a part of that. And so what would be an obstacle for you going on that trip? What would be, what is keeping you from that? And begin to think about how those obstacles might be removed. Are those things that God is removing and you're just kind of, you're like, no, God, don't take the obstacles away because I don't really want to go. Or are you actively working to, to tear those things down? See, the big subjections that we have are, are these, these, after reading and thinking about it in my own life, these are really the five big objections that we have to being on missions. First of all, we, we say we don't have time. And there's some truth to that. You know, if you really think about it, we don't have time, I and mean, we're busy, we've got things to do, uh, we've got people to see, uh, really important things, we've got our families to take care of, and so time really is of the essence. Okay, but what if you said to your wife or to your husband, you said, well, you know, uh, I just don't have time for you. I'm really sorry, I have all these really important things to do, but I just don't have time for you. Well, see, that just, that wouldn't work out very well for you and your marriage. Um, at least it would not work out very well for me at all in my marriage. And my wife would probably, after physically abusing me, would help me understand the error of my thinking in that. And yet, God, who is our creator, who he, we're, He's supposed to be our number one, we're constantly saying no to Him. And so I know that hurts. All right, the second one is wrong priorities. Wrong priorities. So, and that kind of speaks to the time issue. The, the problem is not that we don't have time, it's that we fill up our lives with other things uh, that we feel like we have to do. And so therefore, we've made missions a lesser priority. Three, can't afford it. Now, sometimes that's the case. Other times, I mean, I, I, will, I will be honest with you, the last two international mission trips that I've been on, um, the first trip was just for myself, I need to raise about two thousand dollars, and because of well, several, some of you in this room who gave and others, I it cost me zero to go on that trip. So I was able to fly all the way from here to Ukraine, be there for nine days, and return home safely, more or less, maybe five or ten pounds lighter from eating borscht and other vegetable type soups for a whole week. Um, boy, but it was you know kind of a cleansing time in, in a way though. But the, you know I have to say I'm not a huge borscht fan because beets and it's not my favorite vegetable. I don't know if I actually have a favorite vegetable, but uh, that was paid for for me, and so the Lord provided. The uh, second time that we went to Ukraine, my wife came with me, and our two oldest kids, David and Alicia, went. 
and uh, so we needed to raise uh, almost ten thousand dollars and all but about a thousand of that was raised which is nothing short of a miracle so I say that, I share that because a lot of times money is not the obstacle that we think it is. That God makes a way for us and He puts it on the hearts of others like the woman in the video that put the money in the offering plate and so they send us and that's why you know we that's why you know some people might say the kind of radical missionary people well it's not important to send people it's only important to go but that's really not true either you got it we got to have people that can send us but that's just the beginning point not the end point fourth alright we want to go but we can't ever seem to get there because we're trying to do it on our own that we, we say, okay, God, oh, that's nice. You've called me to the mission field now. You just go over here and sit down, and I'll figure out how to do it. And then we end up kind of having the failure to launch problem because we don't really understand exactly what, what God's calling us to do, where He's calling us to, and, and we're not waiting on Him to give us a passion uh, for people group. For me, uh, God has given me a passion for the Slavic people. So whether they're Slavic people here in the United States, whether they're over in Russia or a former Soviet Republic or somewhere south of there in more of the Muslim type area, I have a passion for those people. And as a result of that passion that I believe is from the Holy Spirit, I just I have a desire to learn their language. I have a desire to go and, and to help them. I have a desire to pray for them and encourage them and, and communicate with them through Skype and email and other means, even though I'm completely on the other side of the world. Which is a little crazy, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, I have nothing in common really with someone from that culture. From They're, they're of the Eastern type culture, uh, and they just live a very different life than I do. And so, how is it that I would have such a passion for them, and I believe that's the Holy Spirit. And so, we have to pray that God would give us that passion first, because that becomes the driving force that helps us to overcome all the obstacles that are in front of us. And fifth, ignorance. And that's, you know, the sad reality is, and I don't want you to feel bad, if that's you right now, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, wow, I read Acts 1-8 before, but I didn't really realize that meant that I was supposed to personally be on mission. And so we don't realize it. Somehow we sit in church and we just, just we're just kind of glazed over or something. I don't know. And we we missed that. That was certainly me for years and years sitting in church. I didn't realize that I was supposed to be on mission and even though God hadn't called me to be a a long-term missionary or a foreign missionary or something like that he had still commanded me to go to the ends of the earth and that's I know that's a, can be a harsh and troubling realization when I was uh, um, you know 20 years ago this was the worst possible sermon I could ever hear. I just, I hated it the whole time because the Holy Spirit was convicting me and I just, it was miserable and I just remember just wanting to go la 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 and not want to hear any of it and I would hear the missionaries come and they would share all those stories about how God was at work and people's lives were being changed and I would just, it would just crush me because I had hardened my heart I just wasn't going to go because I didn't have time and it cost too much money and on and on and on. And there were consequences to that, which I won't go into at this moment, but there were consequences to that as I hardened my heart and I, as I wasn't willing to hear that message. But as God began to free me and as I began to surrender and say, okay, God, this is just completely incompatible with my lifestyle. I have young children. I mean, I, have, I, mean, I began to list... It was like this defense. To, I would say to God, of all these reasons why I couldn't go on, a, on an international mission trip or I couldn't go to Nebraska or Arkansas or, or wherever, you know, to inner city St. Louis or Kansas City. And I always had this whole list of reasons and all of these things that I just talked about were certainly on the list. And God was patient with me though and He helped me see that I had hardened my heart. And he helped me see that I was missing a blessing and I was missing provision in my life. That he was going to provide for me had I just repented of my hardened heart and of my sin in this area and followed him. So how should we do missions then? Well, what we really need to do is read Acts 3. We really need to do the whole book of Acts and several other Pauline epistles, but of course we can't do all of that this afternoon. So I found this very short three-minute video, and it's, it's actually called Acts 3 in 3 Minutes. Now, it goes very fast, 
And there's a little bit of humor in it, which is kind of helpful, because about this point in the sermon, that's when you guys are either feeling horribly convicted and you want to completely write me off before God actually makes you do something that you don't want to do, heaven forbid. Or you're just getting really, really bored and you're wanting to do something else. So hopefully this will kind of help us refocus. So, uh, Alan, would you put that Acts 3 video up there for us and then we'll talk about it. In my former video, Theophilus, I explained the life of Christ in three minutes. Now I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. After being crucified, Jesus comes back to life and hangs out with the apostles. He tells them that they will receive the Holy Spirit and be his witnesses. Jesus takes off. The disciples are gathered together on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit arrives. Tongues of fire hover over them, hence the logo. The disciples speak in tongues. Peter preaches the first sermon. 3,000 people get saved. God, one, Satan, zero. The end of Acts chapter 2 is written, providing mission statements for churches in the 21st century. Peter heals a lame man and preaches another sermon. Another 2,000 people get saved. Peter and John are thrown in jail. They are released. Peter and John celebrate with the other believers and pray for continued boldness. God rocks the house, literally. Ananias and Sapphira lie about their offering to the church and are struck dead. Contributions skyrocket. <laughs> the apostles preach again. They are thrown in jail again. An angel releases them. They preach some more. The apostles nominate seven deacons to look after widows and orphans, including Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Stephen is stoned. Present at the stoning is a young man named Saul. We'll come back to that later. Persecution breaks out, believers scatter, things look bad for the church. Or do they? Wherever the believers go, they preach the word, thus fulfilling the Great Commission. God to Satan, still zero. Philip meets a eunuch, the eunuch is baptized. Meanwhile, Saul is on his way to persecute believers in Damascus when Jesus appears. Saul is blinded, Saul is healed. Saul repents and begins preaching to the same people he intended to persecute. God three, Satan, well, you get the idea. Peter has a vision of unclean animals. Peter has an encounter with unclean Gentiles. He gets it. God has extended salvation to the Gentiles. Major game changer. Herod is eaten by worms. Barnabas and Paul start working together, traveling and preaching the word. By the way, I'm going to call Saul Paul now. I don't have time to explain why. Still with me? In Lystra, crowds attempt to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods. They refuse to be worshipped and are stoned. The Lystrians are a tough crowd. Paul and Barnabas survive. Paul and Barnabas part ways. Paul and Silas team up. Timothy joins Paul and Silas. Paul circumcises Timothy. Paul receives a vision of a man from Macedonia asking for help. The party leaves for Macedonia. Spoiler alert, they are thrown in prison yet again. They sing. An earthquake loosens their shackles, but they stick around to lead the jailer to Christ. Yada yada yada, more preaching. In Troas, Paul preaches for so long that the man falls asleep and plummets out a window to his death. The man is resurrected. Paul preaches some more. The man wishes he was dead. Paul returns to Jerusalem, where he is promptly arrested again. He is visited by the Lord, who assures him that Paul will testify about him in Rome. Paul feels better. Paul is transferred to Caesarea, where his case is caught up in red tape for two years. Finally, Paul appeals to Caesar and is put on a fast ship to Rome. The shipwrecks. Paul is bitten by a snake. At last, Paul makes it to Rome. He is placed under house arrest and continues to preach the gospel while awaiting trial. And that is all we know of Paul's story. Somewhere in there, he finds the time to write a few letters. Today, they comprise much of the New Testament. The New Testament is also where you'll find the book of Acts. The end. That happened really fast, I realized that. Uh, so let's slow it down just a minute and let's pick up on some interesting things in the third chapter of Acts that happen. Uh, first of all, if you were following the video, and I realized it was hard to, I had to watch this a couple times to really catch everything in there. Uh, and part of it was I couldn't figure out when he was serious and when he was joking about things. But um, you notice that, that one of the problems that they had early on is that they were all huddling together in and around Jerusalem. That was a problem. They, first of all, they didn't quite understand yet that the message of Christ's death and resurrection was not just for the Jews, but it was for everyone. Okay? Sound familiar? I mean, that really, I mean, that, that sounds a little bit like us. Sometimes we forget that God's truths are for everyone and that we bear the responsibility of sharing those truths. All right, so, but then what happened? There were consequences to that, weren't there? That... They were all persecuted and they were dispersed and scattered to places all around that area. But as a result of that, Christianity began to spread finally for the first time. All right, and that's, you know, obviously Paul kind of comes on the scene there and, and he's a big advocate that the, the truth of, of uh, God's word is for all of humanity, not just the Jewish people. And so it, it does, as said there, it becomes a game changer and things change. And then now the, the focus begins to be an outward focus. And so uh, these missionaries begin to go out to different places and they begin to plant churches. And so we have the scriptures for us they were recorded and inspired by God so that we can look at that 
and answer the question. And again, the question was, how do we do missions? See, it's right there for us. The answer is, we go. See, we get up and we go and we share truth with people and we make disciples and those disciples make disciples and it is a continuing pattern or ought to be an expanding pattern. And so it did. I mean, if you uh, uh, track through history at all, I mean, you can see that, that Christianity went from this tiny little spot in the Middle East and it expanded throughout the entire known world. And so the responsibility of that truth became uh, one that each generation was tasked to share. But then there became a problem. It kind of came full circle back around and now all of a sudden Christianity is spread all through Europe and then when the New World is settled all throughout the New World. And so we have this <coughs> dilemma that everybody starts to get comfortable and think, man, you know, Christianity is pretty well spread everywhere. Let's just, let's just build buildings and let's make nice comfortable seats in those buildings and let's put in air conditioning and heating and all these other nice things and we got comfortable and we started thinking inwardly. So that's always, that's always the end result if we're not careful. That we began, instead of thinking outwardly, because Paul and Timothy and Silas and so on and so forth, they were all thinking about the other people, right? They were thinking about the people not in the church which is what Jesus told them to do. That's why they were thinking of that, because He told them to do that. And so they were, instead of thinking about how they could make themselves more comfortable, they left that comfort, they got on the road, and they began to go to unreached people groups. Did you know that there are over, and this is really shocking, okay, so, and, but this is a true number, there are over 6,000 unreached people groups in the world today. So if you think that Christianity is everywhere and that the truth of the gospel is being shared everywhere, then, then that's simply not true. And so how will they know unless we tell them? And what makes it so hard, I know, is that it's a choice that we have to make. So we can choose to be on mission or we can choose to not be on mission. The problem is it's just like in the New Testament, where we're commanded not to be lukewarm, that you can't, it's one or the other, you can't be both. You can't love God and the world. You're either on mission or you're not. And so we're confronted in that uncomfortable place where we know that there are parts in our life where we're going and plopping ourselves in front of the TV, or we're going hunting, or we're doing these other things that are fun, and we ought to do those sometimes, but we're doing them to the exclusion, and maybe it's work, maybe we're working too much, and then we're doing those things to the exclusion of what the should be the chief concern, and that's following Christ and being on mission. So now, I guess this would probably be a good time to bring up the fact that we have a big mission project this Thursday night out on the square, so hopefully the, the level of attendance just went up, hopefully not just out of guilt, but out of, of an excitement and awareness as the Holy Spirit is working on you and drawing you uh, to this idea. And so we have an opportunity to be on mission here in our community. It doesn't really cost you anything, maybe a little gas to get there, but there's probably people in this room that would actually go and pick you up if that, if that is an issue. And we can share truth. We can be in the community. I mean, our own worship team, and this, this is what really gets me, our worship team is going to be right there in the middle of it, singing songs about God. I mean, right there, right in the middle of it all. And so we have a great opportunity, and John's going to talk more about that at the end. But we're surrounded by opportunities, really, not just this Thursday, not just the Ukraine mission trip that's coming up. Missions can happen in your living room. Missions can happen when you invite a friend, a coworker, someone that you go to school with over, or you take them out to lunch, or you get together for coffee. Missions can happen then. It doesn't have to be in, a, in an organized, elaborate form. The point is that we need to be on mission in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And if we don't, if we fail to do that, then we're failing to live up to God's promises and His blessing that He has for us in our lives. I mean, I, I will tell you, it, it, it has been a life-changing thing for me as I began to surrender and I began to give up 
some things because there is a, there is a cost. There absolutely is. It's not like God just says, "Oh, here, you know, get on my magic elevator. I'm going to take you all over." But there is a cost to being on mission. There's a cost to following God. Period. That we have to give up certain things. But I believe that what we receive as we follow Christ is much greater than what we give up. There is an urgency for me personally when it comes to missions because I, I see in our culture that we're losing the war. I mean, you can measure that in any way you want. You can measure it in the number of people that profess to follow Christ. You can measure it in the number of churches per capita. I mean, a hundred years ago, there were almost ten times as many churches per person as there are now. I mean, just think about that for a minute. Just imagine, imagine the Springfield area, and think of all the churches, you know, especially some of the big ones that are real visible, uh, the buildings anyway, I guess that's not really the church, but we see the buildings. Now, I want you to remove 90% of them. Just make them all go away in your mind. Just kind of, you know, what if 90% of all these churches were gone? That's what's happened in the last century. Now, think about what's going to happen in the next century if we are not on mission, if we don't take that seriously. So there, there is a sense of urgency. And when I was younger, I used to be concerned about my children growing up in a culture that was hostile to Christianity. And you know, compared to the culture at that time, our culture has become somewhat, I mean, there are elements in our culture that are hostile towards Christianity, and they're very vocal about it. And that, that trend continues to go in a certain way. And so what do some of us do? Well, some of us, we get angry and we just we want to fight back and lash out and judge them and, and become angry. And so we, we say all these hateful things towards them and against them. But, but Jesus taught us to love them. That our response is not to, to become angry and to get defensive and to, to segregate ourselves and separate ourselves and our children away from them, but rather to have compassion on them and to go to them, to go to their places. Just like we talked about several weeks ago, Jesus went to the places where the ungodly were. He went there. Even though the, the religious people at that time, they thought that they were unclean and so that... that 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 would be a place that a good Jew would not go, but Jesus went there. Why? Did it to make a political statement? No. No, because He genuinely loved them. He had compassion on them. He cared for them. So that, that has to be the place where we start. See, if you, if you don't care, then you're going to have a hard time gaining momentum in becoming a missional person and living a missional life. Because you have to care first. And when you care, that means you're, you're suddenly you're willing to do things. You know, for example, uh, I remember the first time I went to Ukraine, I really didn't want to go. My kids were really young, and my wife needed me at home, and, and all kinds, and she had a ter terrible time of hardship with kids getting sick and different things happening while I was gone. So that was a very real uh, sacrifice that was made. But there were all of these obstacles and all in my own heart wasn't right and I you know I, I was going to these people that I'd never met I I didn't know what their needs were I didn't understand their culture I was just going out of obedience because God had, had put me in this place and I realized that that I had to go that, that he, he commanded me to go and to not go would be would be disobedience and I'd seen in my life whenever I was disobedient I'd saw the consequences of that and I didn't want to go there and so, kind of begrudgingly, and, and probably not the right, best of hearts, I went. And this had been probably, I don't know, 15 years be before the last time that I went on an international mission trip to Mexico. So I'd almost forgotten, you know, for me, you know, as soon as I go to sleep at night and I wake up in the morning, it's all reset and I can't remember anything. So for me, that was like a lifetime ago. And uh, I couldn't remember what the blessing and the, and the life change that came from that. But when I got there and I met people, and I realized that the statistics, they, they had a face. And I saw the little children, and I saw all the things that they lacked, and I saw 
the, the crossroads for them. If they could choose to, to live without Christ for the rest of their life or they could choose to follow Him and be in the midst of His blessing and have eternal life after they die in heaven, with Him in heaven. And I began to, to have a compassion for them. I began to care. And, and then all of a sudden, where I, where I was begrudgingly going and I was stingy with how much money I was going to spend and, and so on and so forth, then all of a sudden I, I regretted that I didn't bring more clothes and more money to give away. And as soon as I got back, I was so excited to, to send things. I can remember my wife and I putting crayons and markers and things in boxes and sending them and, and we were able to even buy some big ticket things like video projectors and stuff for their church uh, so that they could put the words up on the, in the, on the screen for people at their outreaches and, and we sent money, our uh, Life's Journey sent money last year to, for their children's, uh, they call them evangelizations, it's kind of a funny word but basically just means they go do children's activities and things out uh, at the, uh, they, it's kind of like a community center. See back when the Soviet Union was in control they had these kind of brainwashing centers where people would come in and they would watch propaganda from the socialist propaganda and, and communist propaganda and so um, these and they kind of like media house I think would be the closest translation and so now the church uses these as places for outreach because they're just they're kind of abandoned they're cheap to rent they're cheap to use and they're all over the place uh, and, they, and they're they're just kind of sitting there being unused so the church uses those and so we were able to send money uh, to help with that and so my heart changed and I, I began to have compassion and all of a sudden the sacrifice that seemed so big it, it shrank and it became actually very small. And so that heart change is pivotal. I mean, it, it, it's a requirement for us. Because then we, we're doing what we desire, that our desires become like God's. So really, at the essence, being on mission, at first, it, it really has nothing to do with missions. It has to do with you and God and you guys getting on the same page. See, that seems to be the problem with the Christian life, isn't it? Because God has he's set this, this path for us. And because we're just rebellious at heart, we just want to go the other way somehow, you know? Uh, that's the kind of kid that I was. If you don't believe me, you can ask my parents. Because when my dad would say, well, you should, you should do this, that just made me want to go over here and do this. And I can't even tell you why. Oh, but I can tell you that my kids kind of have the same thing. And so we're all like that. We're kind of born rebels. We just want to do the opposite of what people expect for us to do. And yet, how many of us can share a good testimony where the outcome of that rebellion was positive? Sometimes, but usually not. Usually it does not go so well for us when we continue to resist God. And He may kind of let it go for a while and be patient with us, but there comes a time where we have to surrender or we walk outside of God's will. And we, we walk outside of the life that He has for us. And so our values have to change. What, what's important to us has to change. And it can change. I think maybe some of you, you think to yourself, well, no, money, I mean, money is really important to me and my time is really important to me and I just can't give that up. Especially for people that I don't know and that I don't even care about in the first place. But I, but, but I want to tell you that you can go from that place to the place of joy and excitement and having a desire to give those things up for God's work, you just have to be willing to take those steps that it takes to get there. For some people, uh, some testimonies that people have shared with me, it, it was an overnight thing and just God changed their heart and He changed their life and they began to live a missional lifestyle and, and everything in their world began to change and their depression and their, their anger and, and all kinds of things that are a result of the selfish life that they were in their life, they, they began to let go of those things and now all of a sudden they had this joy and this excitement for doing God's work. And no matter what obstacle or hardship they came up against, they were inspired to move on. In fact, they became more passionate and more excited. I think that's why in the early church we see all, all this overcoming of obstacles because they had so many things to overcome and instead of just laying down and dying and giving up and quitting, they were just became more determined and they become more adamant that they were going to overcome those obstacles because they knew that there were people in those places that were going to die without Jesus if they didn't make it there. And so there was an urgency for them. And they were facing 
a much more difficult and harsh environment. I mean, when we think about the harshness of travel, I mean, listen to my own whining. Oh, it took me 25 hours to get there. I mean, how ridiculous was that complaint? I mean, really, and I'll probably complain about it again. And so Bobby and Rhonda can share, Rhonda can share a testimony, I guess, if I do that. So now I gotta remember to not complain, at least while they're standing, they're standing next to me or sitting next to me. Well, it used to take years sometimes to get places for missionaries to, to travel across land and they had to get on a boat. And, and even before that, there were times they didn't have a boat, so they had to go around a landmass. And I mean, can you imagine how much more difficult it would have been to share the gospel, especially in biblical times, than it is now? In fact, this is probably the easiest time in the history of the world to share the gospel. I mean, I can get on my phone right now and I can talk to via Skype or via Facebook or a thousand other ways people that are completely I mean that right now it's night they're sleeping so they probably wouldn't appreciate it if I did that right now I mean can you imagine how amazing that is compared to when it, the time that these that were in the New Testament were told to go and make disciples I mean, we ought to be lined up praising God, saying, God, thank you that you've made it so easy for me to be on mission and to live that missionary lifestyle. And yet, somehow, in our ease of life, in our, where we have plenty of food, we have plenty of just about everything, we've gotten comfortable with that, we've fallen in love with that, and now, whenever it's time to look at Acts and look at the way a Christian ought to behave, and to conduct one's life, man, now we're, we've lost something. You know, I will tell you, our, our staff, all of, them are, all of them are unpaid, and yet I see them being faithful. In their free time, there's, no, there's nothing in it for them. I mean, at least I get a salary. At least there's something for me that I can say, oh, well, the church has done something for me, but, but actually it costs them money to go to church because they all tithe faithfully. So they're actually giving. It actually costs them money to serve and to be on mission. And yet, I go to youth on Wednesday night. And I, we had 14 students last week. I mean, how amazing was that? I totally, I can't tell you how excited I am. And the last time I went to Ignite several weeks ago, they had 30 plus some odd students. And these, and these, our staff is just working hard. They're on mission. They're sacrificing. They could be hunting. They could be at home watching TV. They could just be relaxing. They could be doing one of a million other things. But they've, they are just, they've decided that you know what. Until the church can afford to pay me a salary, I'm going I'm to go be on mission. I'm going to be faithful to what God's called me to do, no matter what. Boy, and I'm thankful for them. These are men and women, God, that I can look at, and, and, and they inspire me. So, we're kind of back to, and as we begin to kind of wind this down, because I, I wanted to make this like a 10-week 10, 10 series, but I decided that, that probably it wouldn't be very favorable uh, for everyone else. So we're going to kind of get it all done right here today, at least as far as the message. But I, God's really put it on my heart because I think there are some of you that are, that are struggling. You kind of have a foot in both worlds. And, uh, you know, in, in Star Trek, and in, in if you follow the shows at all or the movies at all, you know, it's really the same type of dilemma that they, they have this mission to go out and explore new places and, and meet new people. And there's always obstacles that come up that prevent them. You know, sometimes it's war, sometimes it's famine. There's all these obstacles that arise that keep them from completing their mission. And sometimes it's the people. You know, sometimes, you know, of course, there's always a villain. Uh, just like any good movie, there's a villain that, that comes up there to, to prevent them, to cause problems with the crew and with the team. And so there's a lot of similarities for us as we, you know, for those of you who are Star Trek fans that are kind of gearing up for the new movie that comes out in a week or so, you're kind of thinking about that on your mind. But you know, the truth is we ought to be excited about being on mission for God. And sometimes... And see, now I can even point the finger at myself here a little bit. We get more excited about football or movies or you fill in the blank for you. We get more excited about that than being on mission for God. And that's how we can know that we've got some things backwards in our life. That's how we can know that our priorities somehow 
It's not that we meant to do that, it's just somehow we got off a little bit. And so we need to take some time, I think, and pray about this. And I, I, you know, we have, we have about four or five confirmed team members to go to Ukraine this year. And we really need six to eight. So I really believe there are two or three people that God is working on right now in their hearts that He's told them to go, but they're just struggling with either the means to go or they're struggling with that decision and the cost that's involved with that. And so maybe, maybe one of you is in the audience right now and you're listening and you're thinking, man, I, gosh, I don't know, God, that's, that's really far away and I've got school or I've got work or I've got children at home. And, and maybe for some of you that it's time to just really think about those obstacles. Maybe many of you are really not to the place where you're even sending someone. Maybe you're not to the place where you're willing to share the gospel with someone and you just need to, to begin to have that passion come alive in your heart. But whatever decision it is that you need to make, it can happen right now as we pray. And so let's just have some quiet time. And if you need to talk to me, and maybe you're a little scared of that, Pastor Jeff's sitting right here, Pastor John's nearby, there's lots of other people that would be willing to talk with you about this. So please don't harden your heart. Let God mold you and shape you. I can promise you this, as someone who's taken that journey, you will be a happier person. You will find more joy in your life when you decide to surrender it fully to following Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you've allowed us to be here today. And Lord, it's kind of a different day because we haven't focused on a certain sin or we haven't focused on something in our lifestyle or, or something in a traditional sermon, yet we've been challenged with this truth. And it just peers at us like the all-seeing eye. And we can't seem to get away from it, no matter where we go or what we do or how much we stick our fingers in our ears and say, la, la, la. That truth is always with us. That you're always calling us out, away from our comforts. Lord, for some of you, you're calling us to go to the ends of the earth. Some of us are calling to reach our community right here. Some of us are being called to states that are nearby. Lord, some of us, you're maybe calling to adopt young children into our families that have become orphaned. Lord, missions, as you know, can take on so many different ways and it can become very confusing for us. But would you open our hearts, would you open our eyes so that we could truly see your calling in our life. God, I pray that you would just move in our hearts, set us free from the bondage that we have, the, the prison, the jail that we've put ourselves in, that keeps us from realizing the joy of living the life that is full of freedom and is full of joy and serving and giving. God, forgive us for our apathy, for our complacency, Lord. And let us stand up today and truly be the church. And we just thank you and ask all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.